Uh, good morning to everyone. My presentation is entitled Embedded Social Scientists, Warriors for Peace. Uh, as an introduction, we know that many national governments have increasingly recognized the role of social scientists in humanity's search for peace. In the Philippines, for example, where I come from, anthropologists, historians, lawyers, and political scientists have been tapped by the Philippine government's peacekeeping efforts, such as in undertaking negotiations with armed rebel groups and in the establishment of zones of peace. There are several other models utilized by other countries to tap the expertise of social scientists in order to solve the problems of social conflict, violence, and warfare. My, the objectives of my presentation are threefold. First, to examine the model of incorporating or embedding social scientists in peacekeeping efforts of various armed forces. Isn't this quite contradictory? These are armed forces such as the military and social scientists are there to work for peace. Second, to reflect on the role of social science in the search, social scientists in the search for peace. And lastly, to identify the ethical implications of social scientists' involvement in these peacekeeping efforts. The most famous, if not infamous, case of embedding social scientists, as our chair mentioned, of course, is uh, started with embedding journalists together with CNN or BBC, but later on embedding anthropologists, sociologists, linguists, and other social scientists in the U.S. Army. And this is known as the human terrain system in the United States. But the concept of the HTS, or Human Terrain System, was first espoused in an article for the Military Review way back in 2005 by the anthropologist Montgomery McFaith, and together with Andrea Jackson, that proposed for the establishment of a Pentagon Office for Operational Cultural Knowledge that would address the identified gaps in commanders and staffs understanding of the local population and culture based on the U.S. military's experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. From July 2005 until August 2006, the U.S. Foreign Military Studies Office initiated a pilot project named Cultural Operations Research Human Terrain System. And later on, in October 2006, the outline of the human terrain system was announced to the public through a press release. So unlike previous covert operations where social scientists are engaged and involved, this time the HTS is more or less uh, transparent to the public that social scientists are involved in this effort. In January 2007, the HTS started recruiting the first batch of social scientists to be deployed overseas, more particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. In February 2007, the HTS was implemented as a proof-of-concept program of the U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command with one team deployed to Afghanistan. By mid-2007, there were already two teams in Afghanistan and three teams in Iraq. So what is this human terrain system concept? It is a military intelligence support program of the U.S. Army that employs social scientists to provide military commanders and staff with an understanding of the local population in countries where it is deployed. That's why the name human terrain, which according to the U.S. Army is defined as the human population in the operational environment, as defined and characterized by anthropologic and ethnographic data and other non-geographic information. 
Among these social scientists are anthropologists, linguists, political scientists, sociologists, and those engaged in regional studies. So there's an admission by the U.S. military that a purely military effort in solving the war in Iraq and Afghanistan won't work. And they have to rely on social scientists in understanding local culture. Um, what are its aims and goals? Uh, to improve understanding of the local population, apply this understanding to military decision-making process, and to address an operational need in the U.S. Army for sociocultural support. So this photograph shows Professor Carroll, uh, Catherine Carroll, joining the war effort or the peace effort, however you would like to call it. The HTS has uh, two components. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, an army enduring base which conducts trainings and deployed teams. There are several teams deployed in the field, uh, whether at the local level, at the regional level, or at uh, the more bigger country level. Let us compare how HTS has developed from 2007 up to 2010. In 2007, it was just a proof of concept program now it is a permanent program of the U.S. Army. In 2007, there were five teams deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now there are third, uh, 2010, there were 31 HTS teams in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're contemplating on sending similar teams in Mexico and other parts of uh, South, Central and South America. With a 20 million US dollar budget in 2007 and 2008, that's for two years. Now, as of 2010, it's a 150 million annual budget. So it shows how important it is to the US military. And of course, the US military mentioned some successful efforts due to the HTS. For example, in the Papya province in southeastern Afghanistan, HTS anthropologist Tracy Benoit, Saint Benoit, was able to identify that there was a high number of poverty-stricken widows in that province who were forcing her, their sons to join the Taliban because they're very poor and the pa Taliban uh, forces were well paid. Because of this study by St. Benoit, the U.S. Army shifted to uh, providing uh, livelihood uh, and employment programs for these widows. St. Benoit was also uh, instrumental in identifying a certain incident where a local leader belonging to the Sadran tribe was killed and in the past, it was just seen as an intimidation effort by the Taliban. But based on the anthropological research of St. Benoit, it was a means to divide the Sadran tribe. That's why the U.S. Army focused on uniting this tribe and later on winning them over in the struggle against the Taliban. Another notable success, according to the U.S. Army, is Operation May 1 where uh, the U.S. military was able to identify who Taliban leaders were based on their body language. So it's a study on kinesics. Because the Taliban leaders were not necessarily the ones negotiating, but there were other negotiators, but they were just behind the scene. But based on study by linguists, they were able to pinpoint who among the local population were the leaders, and therefore uh, isolating them, and later on also introducing development projects such as roads, uh, deep well for irrigation, mobile medical clinics, etc. Okay, let us listen to some. Uh, it was a very controversial project, and the anthropologists were divided as well whether to support or to. Uh, to oppose the human terrain system. Of course, those 
who were in favor of the HPS, such as the anthropologist David Matsuda mentioned, there is a chance to change the nature of warfare, the chance to, to anthropologize the military and not the other way around, the chance to lessen casualties, to avoid conflict, take people through the post-conflict to peace, I came here to save lives and to make friends out of enemies. Another uh, point of view coming from an independent journalist who was critical of the HTS but mentioned some successes of the HTS. Uh, he said that uh, the HTS had been successful in advising U.S. military in Iraq on proper mealtime etiquette, not only how to properly eat, but also the gestures during the meal, especially how to observe the Ramadan feast, which military men don't know. As you will see here, the U.S. military has many plans to engage with social scientists, and the budget keeps on increasing, such as studies on language, on uh, analysis and research, small business grants, etc. Of course, the American Anthropological Association was very critical of this project and viewed it as an unacceptable application of anthropological expertise. It argued that working in a war zone would conflict with the American Association's code of ethics to do no harm to those they study. Voluntary informed consent as required by this code is also impossible to be secured from the people in the conflict area. Uh, one commission under the AAA, this is the Commission on Engagement of Anthropology with the U.S. Security and Intelligence Services mentioned, when ethnographic investigation is determined by military missions not subject to external review, where data collection occurs in the context of war, integrated into the goals of counterinsurgency, and in a potentially coercive environment, all characteristic features of the HTS concept and its application, it can no longer be considered a legitimate professional exercise of anthropology. So these are two worlds apart from <coughs> viewing the HTS. The network of concerned anthropologists echo this view and ask the U.S. Congress to stop government support to this program. According to Professor Hugh Gusterson, the Pentagon seems to have decided that anthropology is to the war on terror what physics was to the Cold War. Asking an anthropologist to gather intelligence that may lead to someone's death or imprisonment is like asking an army doctor to kill a wounded insurgent. So it's like Hippocratic Oath of Doctors. So, uh, there are several other views on this uh, concept and, of course, other similar initiatives such as the Minerva Research Initiative. This was way back in 2008 where the U.S. Department of Defense provided $50 million to fund academic research on five major themes. And these themes are quite interesting. China, terrorism, Iraq, Islam and open to other sources of funding. I wonder what would be the similarity among those things. Uh, the goal of the project was to create improved relations between the Department of Defense and to create knowledge that the military can benefit from in the long term. Okay. Uh, I won't go into this detail since I don't have much time. No, otherwise we will miss lunch. Yes, okay. So uh, let me go to, this. these things are not new to anthropology and social science. Uh, let me raise some issues. Uh, some of the questions that come into my mind, is it really impossible for social scientists to work with a military without compromising their professional responsibility. This is something to think about. Should social scientists shy away from collaborating with the military? Is opposition to the human rights system because it is in support of a military program in general? Or is it because it is a US military program? Okay. 
Will there be a difference in attitude if it was a program of another country or another agency? On the other hand, is there a similar uproar or sanction against social scientists who are involved in non-government movements that are out to overthrow established governments? For example, in my master's thesis, I worked on the guerrilla communist movement in northern Philippines, and there were five anthropologists involved in the armed movement to overthrow the government. So is, isn't this the same thing and something to think about? I don't have questions. And I don't have answers, and I would like to open that to the floor. However, uh, my reflection is this. In the past, many researchers in social science have been focused on understanding conflicts and in developing conflict theories. In my view, there should be a shift towards peace studies and look for ways as to how social scientists can contribute to the achievement of global peace. The peace research agenda, however, should not be a monopoly of a single country. And this is where I would differ with the HKS. As there is a tendency for a government to equate its own national interests as the interests of the global community. So I think a peace agenda that includes the military should be multinational and uh, uh, multi-ethnic in, in terms of form as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.